Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. If you want to get your King James Bibles out and open to Titus chapter 2, verse 1. Okay. Part of our series for Are You Looking for That Blessed Hope? Are you looking? One of the ways that you look for that blessed hope, it talks about sound doctrine. Not just doctrine, but sound doctrine. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Titus chapter 2, verse 1. says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Now, just a rehashing a little bit of the intro. If you didn't see the intro, please go watch the intro. We talk about what that, and we're going to talk about it again a little bit for it's an encouragement, but what's that blessed hope? The great glorious, appear, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, that catching away the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. We're only two-thirds redeemed. Our soul and our but our spirit is redeemed, but this body is not redeemed. And we're looking forward to that day, and we're living our life for Jesus Christ up to that day. So what does it mean to look for, the, for that blessed hope? Well, one of the things we see here in uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 1, it says, But speak thou the things which can become sound doctrine. Okay? This writing that we read in Titus is written to a young man in ministry. Okay. However, all the men in the body of Christ as a whole need to stand and speak sound doctrine as we read. If you go jump down to t Titus 2, chapter 6, it says, Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, according to this, which we'll get into it later. Uh, good works, because we're going to go for uh, chapter by chapter, but showing a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness. So there we see it. In doctrine showing uncorruptness. Okay. So you got Paul. He's writing to a man in ministry. And as we get into some of the scriptures, it's going to talk about he was told to teach other men the doctrines so they could pass it on to other men and to other men and to other men. Okay. Brothers and sisters of Christ, um, the Bible also talks about how the husbands are to wash their wives by the watering of the word. The husbands are going to teach their wives doctrine. Okay, you've got men that are called into full-time ministry, men of God that preach doctrine to the brethren as a whole. You have husbands teaching their wives doctrine, washing their wives by the watering of the word. The Bible also talks about how the parents are supposed to raise their children in the admonition of the Lord. Okay, you're supposed to be slowly teaching your children the doctrines that are in this Bible over time as they get old enough. Okay. And sometime, at some time, when they get old enough, they're going to have to make a decision, Jesus Christ or the world. And that's going to become between them and God. Okay, But you're supposed to prepare them for that decision okay? by raising your children in the admonition of the Lord. We have men that are called into ministry to preach the word. You have 2 Timothy, 2, 2 Timothy 4, 2. You don't have to really hold your hand there because that's just the first verse. Uh, and we're going to go verse by verse, and we're going to do studies, and we're going to get into the milk as well as the meat, but mainly the milk. We're going back to the milk. What is doctrine? Well, doctrine is something that we read there, but Tim, Titus, but speak thou things which become sound doctrine. So you have men that are commanded to pass on sound doctrine to other men, to the body of Christ as a whole. Okay? Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Doctrine. Okay. And if you keep reading, it says, For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Okay. We'll get into that a little bit later. You just, Keep reading, but right there, they're supposed to preach, okay, preach the Word. Well, what's the Word they're talking about? The perfect written Word of God. For today, it's in English in the King James Bible. That's where we get God's perfect written Word. You preach the Word from here, and be instant in season, out of season. Okay? Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.2 2 reads... And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So the whole point is, is we're supposed to take these doctrines that we'll talk about in more detail in, in part two. 
But right now we're talking about what doctrine is and why it's important to preach doctrine. Okay? Then we're going to go into what the doctrines are in part two and how they're perverted today. Okay? But the doctrines are supposed to be passed down. Okay? I learned my doctrine from men in ministry. Okay? I pass on those doctrines to other men that watch this ministry. But doctrines aren't necessarily words. They're also, as we're going to, I'm going to head myself again a little bit, but they're, we'll, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. Okay. But what is doctrine? Okay. We have what is sound, I have, I put on here, what is doctrine, but what is sound doctrine? So first let's start with doctrine. What is doctrine? The Webster's 1828 Dictionary, one of the definitions it says, for definition number one, it says, in a general sense, whatever is taught, it's a teaching. Hence, a principle or position in any science, whatever, is laid down as true by an instructor or a master. This is true. The doctrine of the gospel are the principles or truths taught by Christ and his apostles. The doctrines of Plato, here's where it gets interesting. The doctrines of Plato are the principles which he taught. Hence, a doctrine may be true or false. It may be in mere tenet or an opinion. Okay? You can have feelings and opinions, or it's absolute truth. It's God's word, or it's man's words. And it's funny that they choose Plato. Okay? Because Plato is always about life. This is how life is, and how you're to live your life, and how you're to look at life and everything. And we're going to go through some more definitions and use uh, examples in the Bible. But ultimately, what I believe what a doctrine is, the best way to describe a doctrine, it's a teaching that's life-changing. It's a teaching that you apply to your life, and it changes your life. Who, uh, how you live your life, and who you're living your life for. Okay? That's the, that's the key there. Okay? That's what I believe the best way to, to sum up doctrine. It's a teaching that's life-changing of how you live your life, and who you're living your life for. It also changes how you see the world and how you look at things. But once again, how you live, how you look at your things, your priorities. It used to be I used to live for me, but now who are you living for? Because one of the one of the doctrines of this book is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who are you living for now? Before I got saved, myself. After I got saved, for Jesus Christ. See, there's a change. It's a teaching that that you apply to your life, and it's a life-changing teaching. But we see there that it can be true, it can be false. In other words, it can come from God. You don't have to turn here, but Psalms 138.2. I will worship towards thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God's word. That's how important God's word is. Is it coming from God? Or is it coming from the world? Is it coming from men? John 6.63, we read, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Like I said, before I was saved, I lived for this. Me, myself, and I. After I got saved, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The Holy Spirit comes in, the Comforter, opens God's word to me and teaches me how to live. Teaches me the doctrines, and I can learn it from other men, and I can learn it from this book. All right. They are spirit, they are life. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Okay? The Bible talks about that this book will effectually work within you, but also believes. That you don't take it as the words of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Right? It can come from God. A doctrine can come from God. Or it can come from man. You can read in Jude 1, 16, where it says, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouths speak great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. That's about what men say. Okay, it's not about what God said, it's about what men say. And I'm a follower of Him, so i got to go with what He says, not what God says. If what He says lines up here, great. But if what he says doesn't line up here, you're to follow this, brothers and sisters of Christ. Same thing with me, because I do make mistakes. I'm not perfect. If what I say doesn't line up with scriptures, you're to go with what the scriptures say. I've always said this, brothers and sisters of Christ. Let's, when I have someone come to me, 
like they're supposed to, and say, hey, I disagree with you on this subject, whatever the subject is on the Bible. Right? I always look at them and go, here's my attitude, and here should be your attitude. Let's find out where the Bible's right and I'm wrong. The Bible's always right. If it seems like I'm right, that's because I line up with the Bible. Because the Bible's always right. God's Word is always right. It's always true. And if I'm wrong, it's because I'm failing to line up with this book. That's why I say, let's find out where the Bible's right and where I'm wrong. And if you come in with that attitude, chances are we're going we're gonna to be on the same page. But if you come into that attitude that you're wrong, let's say you're coming to me, Philip's wrong and I'm right, then it has nothing to do with this. No matter what, how much scripture we go through, it's going to be pointless because you're about your position and you're right, and I'm about my position and I'm right. How are you going to get anywhere? you got to come with it with, this is God's perfect written word, this is absolute truth, this is correct. Let's find out where I line up with this book and where I don't line up with this book. And I'm coming to a brother in Christ to say, okay, let's, let's go through the scriptures, and the Lord showed me this, and I believe it goes against what you just said. Okay, that's the right way to do it. Right? But when you become a respecter of persons, it's all about what that person said, it's not about what the Bible says. This is the final authority, brothers and sisters of Christ. Romans chapter 16, verse 18, we read, For they are such that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. It's about what they want. And they're good at getting you to start falling apart and start going back to your old self about what you want. The world's way. The world's wisdom over God's wisdom. And that's where we get 1 Corinthians 3.19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Do you want the wisdom of the world? Or do you want God's wisdom? I've chosen God's wisdom. And brother, sister in Christ, a lot of you have chosen God's wisdom. But every once in a while you've got that pull that's trying to get us away from this. And get us over there to the world again. And you're going to be fighting that pool until the day you die or until we get caught up. That's why we're supposed to be watching and looking for that blessed hope. All right. So we learned there, one of the definitions is that doctrines can be based off of men's wisdom, man's wisdom. Or doctrines can become about God's wisdom. All right. Another de definition is the act of teaching. Chapter 2, act of teaching. Uh, Mark 4.1. If you turn to Mark 4.1. Matthew, Mark, Matthew, or Mark 4.1. Mark 4.1 we read, And he be began again to teach by the seaside, Jesus Christ. And there was a gathering unto him, a great multitude said that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, he's teaching, doctrine through parables. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And he goes into the story about the sower. Okay. But it's a doctrine and it's a teaching. It's the act of teaching. Okay. But if you notice, we're not going to go into it too much now, but Jesus, when he did a lot of the parables, they had meaning that were life applica application. Showing that, hey, this is your condition now, and this is how your condition should be. This is what you've done in the past that's wrong. This is what you should be doing. Right. But it's the act of teaching. Okay. Uh, three, learning. Third definition, learning, knowledge. Where you're teaching, but you're also learning. Okay, We can have teachers that teach us, but we can also read the scriptures and pray and compare scripture with scripture, and we can learn. We can watch from teachers and learn. So you're not always the teacher, but you're also someone that learns from other people. So you can learn doctrine, you can teach doctrine, you can learn doctrine. And it's knowledge. Isaiah 28, 9. Isaiah 28, 9. Uh, back to the Old Testament. It gives an example of this. Isaiah 28, 9. Okay. Isaiah 28, 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. 
brothers and sisters Christ, Paul talks about how he can't give some people meat because they need they they still having a hard time handling the milk. Okay, the easy, simple stuff, the basics. Okay, and we're going to talk about basics, but we're also might every once in a while go into some meat. But we talk about that. You have to learn the milk first, then you can learn the meat. But doctrine is something that is taught. Doctrine is something that is learned. And as we're going to le learn in part two of the study that how doctrines are getting perverted, doctrines are something you live. Action. Okay. Four says the truth of the gospel in general. We don't have to turn here because we just read that. Titus chapter two, the example it gives of this one is Titus chapter two, verse one. But speak thou thy, the things which become sound doctrine, the truth of the gospel in general. And if you notice, a lot of the doctrines that we have from this book, it always goes back to Jesus Christ. Okay? That this is God's perfect written word. It goes back to Jesus Christ. He's the capital W word. The lowercase w word is men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost comes in and teaches people how to speak. And that's how we get the word of God today. And the book, from capital W word, Jesus Christ, we just read one where he's preaching about the sower. And then sometimes men who spake by the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. But it always goes back to Jesus Christ. Uh, the gospel clearly goes back to Jesus Christ. Dispensational teaching, how God dispenses his grace in each dispensation. And today it's through Jesus Christ, his son. Okay. Um, eternal security goes back to what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. You're sealed into the day of redemption. Uh, the Godhead goes back to who Je gives us a little bit more, lets us know a little more, it's, like, it's more meat, but lets us know more about who Jesus is, how things work. It still goes back to Jesus Christ. It goes back to the gospel. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to get into much. we'll do that in the next part too. But it pretty much, predominantly goes back to who saved you, why you needed to get saved, and who it is you serve. Mm -hmm. I always do that with people I believe have fallen away to the point where there's just no reaching them other than to preach the gospel to them. It's not because I believe they're lost, but because they've fallen away to the point where all you can do is preach the gospel to them and move on. And in hopes that it will remind them who saved them, why they needed to get saved, and who it is they serve. Okay? But, the God, but the doctrines are basically a doctrine for us today. Always go back to Jesus Christ. Okay? But the truths of the gospel in general. Uh, definition number five. Instructions and confirmation in the truths of the doc, uh, gospels. So you have the truth of the gospels in general, and then you have instruction. You know, 2 Timothy 3.10. Back to the New Testament. 2 Timothy 3.10. 3 verse 10. Second. Oh, I'm in first. 2 Timothy Three verse ten. There we go. Second Timothy, three verse ten says, "But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, doctrine. If you have your doctrines correct, your manner of life is going to be correct. If you have your doctrines correct, your purpose is going to be correct. Focus. If your doctrines are correct, your faith is going to be correct. Right? Your long suffering." If you have the right doctrines, it will encourage you, like the catching way of the body of Christ. This isn't it. I'm going home someday to be with my Lord and Savior. No matter how bad it gets down here, I get reminded by that doctrine that this time period is but a moment, a blink of an eye, compared to all eternity. And that this body, I'm not going to be stuck with this body of sinful and wickedness for all eternity. There's going to come a time where I'm going to get rid of this body and I'm, this uh, and this corruptible is going to put on incorruption. Okay? It's an encouragement. Uh, long suffering. If you have the proper doctrines, you'll be able to long suffer. You'll get through things. Uh, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. When you're standing for the right doctrines, you're going to go through persecutions and afflictions. When you're standing for absolute truth. The world as a whole hates this book, and they hate the truths that are found in it. Right. So a doctrine is a teaching, but as we read there, I believe it's not just a teaching in itself. Oh, it's just something, you know, to teach. It's a teaching that's life-changing. 
that changes how you live your life and who you live your life for. If it's sound doctrine. But sometimes even false doctrines get you to start living your life for the wrong person and doing the wrong thing. Okay. That's why it says sound. He's telling Titus to speak sound doctrine. What does sound mean? Well, one of the de definitions in the Webster's 1820 Dictionary 6, I put this in here, whole, entire, unhurt, unmutilated as a sound body. Now, this isn't the main definition, but I had to read that because unmutilated, unhurt. Now, you can't hurt this. You can reject it. But there's people out there that by the time they get done messing with it to get it to please them and to please the world, it doesn't look like this at all anymore. And it's just so messed up, some of the false doctrines that are out there. They're so mutilated. Okay, If it's sound, it's unmutilated, but they just dissect the word and cut it up, keep what they want, throw the rest out. Another definition, eight, I put down here, founded in truth, firm, strong, valid, solid, that cannot be overthrown or refuted. Now, don't get me wrong, the lost world will always try to refute this Bible, but we're supposed to be in the same mind and the same judgment, striving together. We're supposed to be on the same page. We have God's perfect written word. We have sound doctrine. Okay? Sound doctrine. We have a final authority that everyone gets held to. Okay? What happens is, is the world likes to take the authority from here and place it here. And that way, if it's here, everyone has their own authority. And that way, that's why we got the huge mess that we do today out there. All the false religions, uh, the false doctrines and everything. People button heads left and right. That's one of the reasons. The other reason is, is they don't want truth. Okay, like I said, true doctrine is life-changing. And the reason, one of the number one reasons people reject the true doctrines in this book is they don't want to change their life. They don't want things to change. They want to continue as they are. Okay. Overthrown or refuted as sound reasoning, a sound argument, a sound objective, sound doctrine, sound principles. Okay, It's solid. It's firm. Okay. Uh, definition number nine. Right. Correct. Well-founded. Free from error. And that's where it gives an example of Psalms 119.80 where we read... You can always pause the video and turn to some of these. But I want to get through this. It's going to be like a two-hour study. It'll be five hours if I turn ever because I'm so slow. Psalms 119.80. Let my heart be sound in thy statues that I be not ashamed. It's not a state of being. When you hide God's word in your heart, the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. When you're hiding God's word, God's statues, the doctrines, God's word in your heart, it's to live it. Notice he said, that I might not be ashamed. Why are you ashamed? Because you did something wrong. That's why you're ashamed. You didn't do according to this. You decide to go like this and go your own way, and you did something stupid, something foolish, and now you have every right to be ashamed, and you should be ashamed. I've been there, brother and sister Christ, I've been there. But the whole point is not just hiding your heart. They always try to mistake in this for this. Memorizing scripture is great, but if you don't take that scripture and put it in your heart and start living it, then all that memorization is worthless. If you're not hiding it in your heart, which means living it, applying it to your life and living it. Those doctrines that you have up here, because some people have a lot of head knowledge, those doctrines you have up here, they mean nothing if they're not down here, which means you're applying them to your life. Right? So where does a Bible-believing, God-fearing man get his doctrine from? Well, we get our doctrine from here. How do we know that? Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16. We're already there. 2 Timothy 3.16, we read all Scripture, all Scripture throughout the whole Bible, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, it is profitable for reproof. Now that's how this English works. I've had someone that a little side note. I had someone that was I was trying to preach the truth to about the catching away of the body of Christ, and they kept getting into uh, their post trip, and they and I just tried. They keep grabbing here and saying when I told them that 
You can't go all over the Bible for doctrine. You can go over the Bible for instruction. Right? Oh, no, no, this says that it's good for all four at the same time. It's like, that's not how you read English. If, if you had four sentences that you wanted to bring into one sentence, this is what it would look like. But what would it look like if, if it was four sentences? It would say, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is probable for doctrine. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for correction. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for instruction in righteousness. All right? When you bring it together, there are all four. It doesn't mean that you're going to find all four of these in every single verse in this book. Okay? But here's the thing. You are going to find doctrine in the Old Testament. Absolutely. You're going to find out. What's the, I'll give you an example. What's the doctrine of the... Of the um, when uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, what's the doctrine then? I'll tell you what the doctrine was. The doctrine was, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's how they found God's grace. By obeying his command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What happened after they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? They fell from grace and were kicked out of the garden. Right? There's doctrine all through the Bible. Right? But the thing is, is what doctrine is for us? But first we're trying to make the point that where do you find your doctrine? In the scripture. All scriptures given by inspiration of God is proper for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? What's the point of having proper, sound doctrine? Verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect. Be how you're acting, how you're living. Be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. To have a perfect heart with the Lord as you live your life down here. I always said, men can't be perfect, but you can have a perfect heart. This body of flesh can't be perfect. I'm a saved sinner. Oh yeah. But you can have a perfect heart with the Lord. Your heartfelt desire is not to want to sin. Your heartfelt desire is to please the Lord. Your heartfelt desire is to obey His Word and live it. Okay, that heartfelt desire, you know you're going to fill the Lord sometimes, but it's that heartfelt desire that's perfect before the Lord. Okay? And this book tells you how to have a perfect heart. Now, like I was saying before, you, you, there's doctrine throughout the whole Bible. But the doctrines for today, for today, you're going to find in Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Okay, you can go through this whole Bible for instruction in righteousness, but your doctrines for today, which is called the time of the Gentiles, which we call the church age, from the death of Jesus Christ, and he's raised three days later, to the catching away of the body of Christ. The doctrines for today are going to be what we call the Pauline epistles. Be very careful. Okay, but when it comes to doctrine today, rightly dividing the word of truth, it needs to be mentioned in one of these books. Okay, for doctrine for today. You can get instruction in righteousness. Why? Because you have the book of Hebrews. Okay, you have the book of James. You have First and Second Peter. You have Jude. Okay, you have the book of Acts. It's a transition book. You have the four Gospels, which is still under, technically they're under the Old Testament. Until Jesus dies, the New Testament doesn't come in. Until there's the death of the testator. That, you find that in Hebrews, but that's instruction in righteousness. All right? But the reason these books that I just mentioned here, Acts, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, Jude, why they're dangerous is because they are preparing people as a transition book um, for going into the time of Jacob's trouble. Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, and Jude are books where it's transitioning the Jews to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. It tells them there's some things that overlap. You can find things that overlap throughout the Gospels and the books I just read there and the Pauline epistles. But it still needs to be in the Pauline epistles. But the reason you see things overlap in those books is because it's a transition book. It's trying to tell the Jew, you don't have to, I'm just paraphrasing, you don't have to go to the time of Jacob's trouble. You can get saved today, here's how. But if you refuse to get saved today, this is what you're going to be going through. This is what you're going to have to deal with. And God knows that a lot of Jews aren't going to get saved in these last days. 
they're going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. I pray that the Jews get saved today. I pray the Gentiles get saved. I pray for salvation for people today. You don't want to go into that time period. But watch out for people that are primarily grabbing from those books, especially the book of Acts, and sometimes from the book of Hebrews, and they're grabbing things from there and making it their primary doctrine when it's not mentioned at all in the Pauline epistles. Be very careful. Acts is a transition book going from the Old Testament to the New, uh, to the New Testament because at the beginning of Acts they're preaching repent, uh, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. That's the same message that John the Baptist gave. When John the Baptist was locked up in prison, Jesus went out and he started preaching that. Why? Because they were preaching the kingdom again. They were trying to offer, even though Jesus died, was buried, and rose again the third day, they went out preaching the kingdom, the physical kingdom, trying to get the Jews another chance to accept their Savior, Jesus Christ, as their king. And when they denied him, I don't know if you remember, um, they denied, um, they stoned uh, Stephen. They stoned Stephen, and he looked up and saw Jesus standing, not seated, sitting, but standing at the right hand of God. All right? In other words, are, are you going to accept me as your king so I can come back and start the day of the Lord? Oh, nope, you rejected me again. Okay, Paul, how many times did he try to preach to the, Gen, uh, the Jews and finally said, I'm going to the Gentiles? He tried. It's a transition book. It started out with repent and be baptized, water baptism, for the remission of sins. And then halfway through, at some point, it gets to the point where it's repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Believe in Jesus Christ. There's a change. It's, and like I said, it's a book that's going... Um, it's a book that's a... transition book. It's going from where they're trying to bring the kingdom of of God, the physical kingdom, the kingdom of heaven also, to the Jewish people again, and they reject it. So then it just goes to repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. That's what it goes to. Right. You have to be careful where you get your doctrine from. It, you, it, it's from this book, absolutely, but then you've got to be careful where in this book. Okay. In order to find that sound doctrine today, we need to read the Bible and you need to study it. And how do we study it? 2 Timothy 2.14. Okay. 2 Timothy 2, verse 14. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit. Oftentimes when you find that words are being striven about to no profit, it's because A, they're either not using the Bible, they're using feelings and opinions, or they're not rightly dividing. Words to no profit but to the subverting of the hearer. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase into more ungodliness. Well, yeah. well, we try to preach truth to people. They want it, great. They don't want it, we move on. Right. We don't listen to them babble and babble and get us into debates and arguments for hours and hours when they don't want the truth. You try to give it to them at first, they don't want it. Next, we're going to take it to somebody else. But how do we find doctrine? We rightly divide. And I just, I read, should have read the verse first as I was explaining, but everything I just said there. We rightly divide, okay? The doctrines that are for the Garden of Eden, that's not for today. The doctrines that were there before the flood, that's not for today. Uh, a lot of the doctrines for Moses, where it's the law. The Levitical laws, those are not for today. We don't have to do animal sacrifices today. Okay? That's why you have to rightly divide the word of truth. If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, it'll lead to more ungodliness. In Galatians, they tried to bring them back under the law. First and Second Corinthians, trying to push, well, like easy believism pushes today. There's no changed life. You can just live as a wicked, wicked sin. You can love your sin and keep your sin and just say, I believe in the big guy upstairs. It leads to more ungodliness when you don't follow the proper doctrines, especially the doctrine of the gospel. Right. Now, we're going to talk a couple times about how Paul talks to Timothy and talks to Titus and how he pushes how important doctrine is. 
and how if you don't have the doctrine, it can easily affect your life, your walk with the Lord, if you don't have the proper doctrine. How the lost world likes to mess them up, because they get warned about the lost world messing up the doctrine. So 1 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. Turn to 1 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. This whole study is about looking. How do you look for that blessed hope? Well, here's the first step. The Word of God. You need to get the Word of God. You need to get saved, but you need to make sure after you get saved, you get the Word of God, and we're going to talk about doctrines. Eventually, we're going to talk about the Gospel, too. But the doctrines, the number one doctrine you're going to hit first when you first get saved is you're going to realize that the Gospel you were preached, that's a doctrine. The Gospel that saved you, that's a doctrine. It's a teaching that's life altering life changing it changed all who you were living for too you weren't living for the world you weren't living for yourself now you're living for Jesus Christ right? but which is our hope that blessed hope Jesus Christ everything goes back to Jesus Christ Paul was looking for that blessed hope we need to also in the life that we're living too unto Timothy my own son in the faith Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still in Ephesus when I went to Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. See, Paul's problem, pro not his problem, but a problem that he, he was fighting, is that he would preach good doctrine, and the moment he turned his back, he had to go over here to preach over here, or go over there to preach over here, and he'd come back here, everything's messed up. Someone's come in and perverted what he taught, the doctrines. Look at First and Second Corinthians. Uh, look at Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Who's trying to pull you back under the, to the laws in order to be saved? Did I not tell you the gospel? Did I not preach the doctrines? Who's coming in and messing all this stuff up? Okay. that they teach no other doctrine. Because he knew people would, and people were in his day. And today, people are preaching other doctrines. Neither give heed to fables and endless, endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in the faith. So do. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. Remember, charity is self sacrifice and your intentions need to be a pure heart not to get something out of it but a pure heart okay. and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned not fake people say well what's an example of fake faith you have people that have faith up here they have the knowledge of what this let's say this group of people are teaching and they want to be part of this group but the faith isn't here. They're not living it. They just, I want to be part of this group, so I'm going to acknowledge it up here. I have the head knowledge, but it's not down here. Okay? Faith unfeigned. Fake. They don't truly believe in that, but they want to be part of this group. So they'll just say, yeah, I believe to be part of this group. How many have had uh, situations where you've had family members that told their parents, yeah, I believe, just to get them off their back? And they have to know a little bit about what their parents believe just so they can fake it to get them off their back. Well, and the battle buildings, the occult personality in the battle buildings, the occult following. And I want to be part of this group, so i got to pretend to believe what they believe. But Jesus Christ, faith unfeigned. Your faith in this book needs to be in this book because you have faith in God and His Word, not what someone is saying behind the camera. Okay, not what I'm saying. It's what I say in line up with this book because this is where your faith is. From which, have, which, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain janglings. We see that going on a lot lately. Desiring to be teachers of the law. Understanding neither what they say nor what they affirm. One of the big things that Paul was having a problem with in, in, that time, in this time period where he's talking to Timothy and he's talking to Titus, one of the things he's having a problem with is the Jews trying to bring the Gentiles back under the law. And they start teaching the law more than they teach the doctrines and the faith. Mm -hmm. 7. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor what they affirm. 
But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient. That's how you use the law lawfully today. Remember what the Bible says, the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It's to let us know that we're under the law of sin and death, we're wicked sinners, we're on our way to hell, and we deserve to go to hell. That's how you use the law lawfully. People who are using it unlawfully are the ones that are trying to get you back under the law in order to be saved. You've got to keep the law in order to be saved. They're deceiving you because you can't keep the law. Nobody can. Nobody did, except Jesus Christ. But when it comes to mankind, God, Jesus says God manifests in the flesh, his creation, nobody in mankind was able to keep the law. Nobody was. No matter how great you look at the greatest characters in the Bible, Moses wasn't able to keep the law. David wasn't able to keep the law. Moses struck the the rock the second time twice and disobeyed God. Right. King David, he committed adultery and had a man murdered. Right. Nobody was able to keep the law. So what's the law there for? The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ and let us know that we're wicked sinners. Mm -hmm. For the ungodly and for the sinners. For unholy and profane. For murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers. For manslayers. That's what the law is there for. For whoremongers. For them that defile themselves with mankind. For men stealers. For liars. For perjured persons. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, anything that goes against bringing you to Jesus Christ to get saved and start living for Him, and start doing things God's way. The laws are a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Don't get struggled that you have to, a lot of religions out there have a lot of do's and do you have to do this to be saved? Do you have to do that to be saved? Do you have to do this to be saved? The only thing I ever did, and it still that didn't save me, God's still the one that saved me, is I came to the cross broken. Dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinner. Having sorrow from my personal sins. Not the sins of the world as a whole. That's where the fake faith comes in. I was a false convert in these Babel buildings. Oh, are you a sinner? Yeah, I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. Yeah, we're all sinners. Well, then believe in Jesus. Okay. I never came with that personal conviction of I am a sinner. My personal sins are sending me to hell. And I deserve to go there. I never really had that. I just repeated what they wanted me to say so I could be part of that group, that battle building. Okay. It's like I said, that's how you get fake uh, faith that's fake. It's fake. It's worthless. That's how you get belief that's vain. Your belief is vain. Right? It's not heartfelt. It's up here. But we see there, once again, contrary to sound doctrine. The lost world is always contrary to sound doctrine. They're not going to be doing things God's way. They, don't, they have this, I don't need Jesus Christ. Yeah, you do. Right? So we see him talking to Timothy. Uh, for, so go turn to 2 Timothy 4.1 about doctrine. 2 Timothy 4.1 I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead. Remember the judgment seat of Christ? The quick and um, the dead at the judgment seat of Christ, that, this saying, it says, the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. There are going to be people that are alive at the catching away of the body of Christ, and then there's going to be the dead in Christ arise first. So you're going to have the quick and the dead being judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Same thing at the end of the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, which is the day of the Lord, when it's talking about his kingdom, when Jesus comes back and rules and reigns. Okay, if Satan gets let loose for a little while, everything, he gets the nations to turn on Jesus, and then Jesus goes, fire comes down, destroys them all, destroys the, the earth, destroys the heaven, and now anybody that was still alive, and all those that died in that thousand year reign that didn't do right, or did right, they're all going to be judged at the, the great white throne. Judgment. Right. Two. Preach the word. We read this earlier. Preach the word. Preach the word. 
He's telling Timothy, make sure when you're preaching, it's the Word. It's not your feelings and opinions. It's not the world's wisdom. It's not traditions of men. Right? It's the Word. Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove and rebuke. In season, out of season? Oh, yeah. No matter what's going on in the world, brothers and sisters Christ, we are to stand by this book and continue living for Jesus Christ. Period. We don't start swerving left and right because of what's going on in the world. We're supposed to stay that straight and narrow path, regardless of what's going on in the world. Okay? Remember what the Bible says? We're not to entangle ourselves in the affairs of this life because I've chosen him to be a soldier. Right now in America, we have sodomy that's out of control. Feminism is out of control. And so many other things. But can we change that out there? No. But can we make our stands here, here, and in our own lives? Absolutely. Make your stand in your life, in your heart. Make your home a Bible-believing, God-fearing home and abstain from all appearance of evil, free home. Absolutely. But can you change the world? No. Then why are you getting so distracted and starting to try to change how you live your life to line up with, the, with being able to endure what's going on in the world? You just live for the Lord. And whatever happens, happens. If you have to die for Jesus Christ, I die for Jesus Christ. Right? If God goes, it's not your time, then I live for Jesus Christ. I remember saying this in the past. It just seems like to me lately, uh, it seems easier for people. They like to talk about, I'll die for Jesus Christ. I would die for Jesus Christ. But you don't hear many people saying, I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. In the Babel buildings, the easy believism, the false religions, I, I'm going to try to use Jesus Christ, an antichrist. Um, I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. They, they're, they're all willing to die for him, but they're not willing to live for him. Okay? okay? Instant, in season, out of season. It doesn't matter what's going on. Our life doesn't change. The, the, the wars that's going on, the fights that we're fighting for, how we're living our life for Jesus Christ doesn't change because the world's getting worse and worse and worse. Don't get distracted by the world. It says here, reprove and rebuke. 2 Timothy 2.25, it says, In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, that God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. In meekness, instructing those. So when you're rebuking and you're reproving somebody, correcting somebody, you do it in meekness. You humble yourself. Okay, We're going to get talk to a verse earlier where it talks about rebuking sharply. You can still rebuke sharply to the point, this is absolute truth, and be stern, but still have meekness. Okay? The whole point is, is you don't want to do it out of pride. Ego. We talked about that in one of our studies. Don't do it out of pride and ego. You're not supposed to be correcting and rebuking people out of pride, out of anger, out of ego, uh, envy, okay, bitterness. We're supposed to do it in meekness. But uh, 2 Timothy 4, 1, we're going to keep going. It says, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. We exhort the brethren. You know what exhort means? To lift up, to encourage, to keep the faith, to keep on that straight and narrow. Keep fighting the fight, the good fight. We're running a race to keep running that race to the finish line. Okay? You're exhorting with all long-suffering and doctrine. And it is long-suffering because we see how bad the world's getting. We see the falling away. Okay? We see brethren falling away. I've seen brethren, they're like fish out of water. I try to get them to the, to, the, to the truth. Oh, yeah, okay. And then you come back later and they're over here. And then you try to bring them back over here. And then they're over here, like Paul did to the Corinthians, to the Galatians. What happened? You guys were on the right path. I set you on the right path. I told you the true doctrine. What happened? Someone came along and messed it up. Okay, let's get back to the true doctrine. Let me try to fix things and correct you. See, it's long-suffering, but you do it through doctrine. 1 Thessalonians 4.1, you don't have to turn there. It says, furthermore, when, furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God. So ye would abound more and more. The whole point of exhorting the brethren with true doctrine and with the word of God is so that you will live a life that pleases God. 
and you'll have that joy and that peace that only God can give. You'll abound more and more. Not necessarily more and more like wealth, physical wealth. We're talking about joy. We're talking about peace. Right? That only God can give. You can be the poorest person. You can be homeless, sleeping in a sleeping bag by the ocean. You have Jesus Christ and you're doing your best to live according to his word. You're going to have peace and joy. You're going to have some long-suffering and some hardships, but you're going to have peace and joy through it. You know when I've lost my peace and joy? When I'm not pleasing God. When I make decisions in my life based off of what I want and I'm doing things my way. That's when that peace and that joy tends to disappear. And then the chastening of the Lord comes and gets me back on the right path. And I'm like, Lord, I don't know why I ever left this joy and this peace. From you, the only God can give, the real joy, the real peace. But yeah, exhorting. You're exhorting to lift him up and to encourage him to get back on the right path. That's what exhorting is. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 we read, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient towards all men. We exhort you. Okay, warn them that are unruly. You need to get back on the right path. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. And be patient towards all men. Notice it says all men there. When you're dealing, like, especially if you're going to go preach the gospel out on the streets, when you're preaching the gospel, you need to be patient towards all men. You can't be losing your temper and you can't be getting angry. When you go to correct somebody, you need to be patient. You need to have meekness. You can't be losing your temper. Right? I understand it's not easy. I failed. I've, lost, I've lost my temper. There's all of us that have lost our temper. It's not easy. But it's the way God has it set up. Paul, I remember Paul talking about how when he heard what was going on in 1 Corinthians, when he heard about the fornication and such fornication that one would have his father's wife, he's angry. And he even says, you, I hope that when I come to you, I will not find you as you are. Like he's hoping that it was a lie. And, uh, and when he does come, I hope you don't find me as I am right now before he came back. Why? Well, right now I am heated, I am angry, I am mad. And that's why he says, I hope God will humble me that by the time I get there, I'll be able to, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, that I can rebuke you and correct you through, through doctrine, through the scriptures, but with the right attitude where you listen. Absolutely. Best way to exhort the brethren, okay? The best way to exhort brethren today is what, brothers and Christ? This right here. One of the best ways to exhort the brethren is doctrine. The gospel. Reminding them about the gospel. I love hearing about the gospel. I love gospel mess, uh, you know, going over salvation teachings that go in a little bit more in depth. And then I love, you know, what Jesus did for me. And it's a reminder. That's how you exhort somebody, through the gospel, okay? Uh, through eternal security. You're eternally secure. You're sealed into the day of redemption, okay? Uh, you exhort someone through the, the blessed hope, the catch away of the body of Christ. This isn't it. No matter how hard it gets down here, this isn't it. No matter how many people, friends, stab you in the back, don't worry. This isn't it. This isn't all there is. We get to be with our Lord and Savior for all eternity. Mm -hmm. But first, that's it. Let's get into that one. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. You don't have to turn there because we've said this verse a lot of time. But this is a good encouragement. When life gets really tough for some of the brethren, the, uh, the backstabbing, how wicked the world's getting, family turning against you, uh, co-workers just treating you like dirt and everything. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all... Ch be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? We're not going to hell when we die. That's an encouragement. If you're truly saved and born again, you're not going to go to hell when you die. Another thing is, is remember, 
Remember the time of Jacob's trouble? Most of us know about the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, we don't have to go through that. You think it's tough now, just read about that and go, whoa, and God's saving us from that. We don't have to go through that. We're going to be caught up before that. Are you looking for Jesus Christ? 56, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, I've used that whole passage to link to people to say, hey, keep up the work, keep living for the Lord, keep staying in your Bibles, keep praying, keep that sanctification in your life going, keep preaching the gospel to everyone you can, leaving gospel tracts out places, no matter how bad it gets. Your, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We're always supposed to abound in the work of the Lord. Why? Because we're looking for that blessed hope. It could happen any day. Ephesians. Ephesians 4.30 is another verse. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed into the day of redemption. How many of you use that verse to encourage, brethren? You're sealed into the day of redemption. That's that day of redemption. Those are the eternal spirit. That's doctrine. The day of redemption is a doctrine. These doctrines are meant to encourage us to keep us focused in living a life of Christ. Get busy living for Jesus Christ. Don't um, what is it? Uh, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, because if you keep doubting your salvation all the time, you're not going to get much done for the Lord. You need to get to a point where you're secure. I'm going to heaven when I die, and if I'm blessed with getting to see the catching away of the body of Christ, I'm going to heaven. Lord, until that day happens, what do you need me to do? And you get busy living for the Lord. I need you to read this book. Start your day with this book and end your day with this book. I need you to study this book. And here, now that you start doing it, here's these things in this book I need you to apply to your life. Ministry of Reconciliation, Sanctification. You see that? Get that out. You see that? Get that out. Hey, there's a brother in Christ that could use your help over here. And so on and so forth. But we've used these verses to encourage people. What about Philippians 4.13? How many of you use this verse to exhort the brethren? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I was telling a brother in Christ once that there's days where I'm like, I just feel like giving up, because, not giving up, but I'm like, I'm out of gas type giving up. I'm out of gas. <sighs> and then the Lord reminds me of that verse. Uh, no, you can do all things through Christ with strength in me. You're right, Lord. Lord, I start getting into the Word. I start getting into prayer. And I start saying, Lord, fill the gas tank. Okay, get me going again. And he does. Okay. Right here, 2 Corinthians 4, 16, 4, it says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. There's days where I just drag it, and I'm like, Oh, Lord, I don't know if I can keep going. And somebody, now when I talk to brethren like that, they'll link me these verses to exhort me. And a lot of these verses go back to, I'm renewed day by day because I have the Holy Spirit in me. I got saved, the doctrine of the gospel. I'm looking forward to the, to the catching away of the body of Christ, the doctrine of the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm eternally secure. Okay. I belong to Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 9 says, I use this verse for brethren that think that they've sinned and just really made a wreck of their lives. 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I hit that brother in Christ up and say, Did you repent? Did you, yeah, yeah, I, I was so sorry. And I said, Lord, why did I do that stupid thing? Uh, please forgive me. Did you repent? Forsake. Get it out of your life. Sanctification. Yeah, God got it back out of my life. Okay, now get back to living for the Lord. Yeah, but there's times where you need to let it go. You've repented, you've forsaken, and you need to get back to living for the Lord. You know the people that are going to hold it against, against you the most? The enemy. Your past sins, they will hold your past sins against you for years. And try to haunt you with those sins. If you've repented, and you've forsaken, and you've gotten back to your walk with the Lord, get back to your walk with the Lord. Let it go. But how many times will we use those verses to exhort one another today? And that's just a little bit. That's, that's not even the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of verses. Abstain from all appearance of evil, brother. There's a lot of them. Okay? 
Are you staying in the Word of God? Do you want to get that sin out of your life? The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. There's all these verses that we use to encourage and exhort the brethren. And a lot of those verses can go back to doctrines. Not just instruction and righteousness, but doctrines. Right? Especially when someone's doubting their salvation. Right? But we see this. We are told in 2 Timothy 4, get back to 4, exalt with all long suffering, exhort, not exalt, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You use doctrine to exhort the brethren and let them know that we're going to be long suffering down here. Okay? God, Jesus Christ can come back any day now, but until he does, we're going to continue to live for the Lord no matter what. And we might have some hard times down here, but we need to be long suffering. We need, to, we need to muddle through if we have to sometimes. Okay? And what the best way to exhort the brothers and sisters in Christ is this right here. I always got frustrated because I sometimes when I was a newly saved, there were some people that I would talk to and I got I got I started to learn really quick that their foundation really wasn't this. Because they'd always try to cheer me up with their own words. Good words and fair speeches. Feelings and opinions. Then I came across some brethren that they quote scripture to me to cheer, and that's what really cheered me up. Right? You want to cheer, exhort the brethren, and you really want to cheer brethren up that are falling. This is how you do it. You want to re rebuke and correct a brother in Christ, get them back on their feet. This is how you do it. It doesn't always work. Sometimes they'll still reject this, but this is how you do it. Second Timothy four, chapter four, verse three. It's continued. Second Timothy chapter four. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Just said we had to be long-suffering. Endure. We're supposed to endure sound doctrine, no matter how bad it gets in our own lives, like our struggles with the flesh and the world. We're supposed to endure sound doctrine. But the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts will pull people away from doctrine. Like I said, doctrines of the Bible that we'll be talking about in part two going over specific doctrines and how they get perverted. It's all about, so I can go, for people who are lost, so they don't have to have that change. There doesn't have to be a change. I can continue living the way I want to live. I can keep doing what I want to do. And if I want to be part of this group, then I'm willing to do what they want me to do to be part of this group because I want to do it. Okay? I had to give up a lot of stuff in my life that at first I fought God on it because I didn't want to do it. And it got to the point where I did it for the Lord because I had to do it. It was His command. Okay? But lusts. Why do brethren fall away from, the people I believe are truly saved, fall away from doctrine? Lusts. The old man. They start missing the old man. The pressures of the world, like I said, the flesh. Either the flesh tries to pull them away from the doctrine, or the world tries to pull them away from doctrine. Covetousness, which is idolatry. Traditions of men. Trying to please men over pleasing God. It causes a lot of men to turn their back on the doctrines. Okay? Lust. After their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. In other words, they tell them what they want to hear. So they can live how they want to live. It always comes back to final authority. I've talked to lost family members, and their problem is, is they don't have a final authority. They're their own final authority. And they get to shop around until they find someone that tells them what they want to hear. The Babel building system. That's all the Babel building system is at this point. So you can shop around and decide and find something that tells you what you want to hear. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned unto fables. Remember we read one of the definitions of sound was is that they um, basically they cut it up, they mutilate it. It's supposed to be unmutilated. But they mutilate it. It's, they turn to fables. If you look, a lot of the fables, a lot of the, the worldliness, the, the wickedness of this world, the fairy tales, Hollywood movies, and TV, they're taking something from here and they're perverting it to the uttermost. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. They're turning. They, never had, they were never part of the truth, but they're, when it says, shall be turned into fables. Oh yeah. 
2 Thessalonians 2.3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man's sin be revealed the son of perdition. There's going to be a falling away first, and even in Paul's day he said, For the time will come, for the time will come, it's future prophecy, where they will not endure sound doctrine. Paul knew there was going to be a time period where the church of God, church of the living God, was going to have the hardest time where you're going to see people dropping like flies. And I believe we're in those days. They're not standing for absolute truth. They're not doing things God's way. They're doing things their way. They're doing things the world's way. I don't know how many, uh, you look at videos that certain uh, channels online, ministries, they just disappear. They're not putting stuff out that much anymore. Even the ones that used to put out stuff a lot, they're not putting stuff out that much anymore. We're struggling, brothers and sisters Christ, in these last days. Okay? We need to endure sound doctrine. 2 Timothy 4, 5. Make sure you're staying in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. But watch thou in all things. Okay, you see that they're not enduring sound doctrine. But you're to watch in all things. What we see going on around us is supposed to strengthen the doctrines. It's supposed to strengthen this book in our heart and in our lives. Okay? But watch all things. Okay, we did an Are You Ready? 8-point checklist for Soldiers for Jesus Christ. This video was meant to exhort the brethren. And one of the points was it says, Watch. The last point of the checklist was, Watch. And when you watch the world, Revelation chapter 3, you don't have to turn here, but Revelation chapter 3, verse 2, it says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. We just read that, uh, that in the last days there's going to be a falling away. We just read for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. When we're looking to see how bad this world's getting, and how much this world is straying from this book and doing the complete opposite and doing anything this book says is wickedness, they love it. Anytime this says it's good, they hate it. What this says is good, they hate. The world is falling apart and it gets worse and worse and it's supposed to be a motivator to keep our eyes on Jesus, that blessed hope, and living for Him every day. We don't get distracted by the world. Get entangled with the affairs of this life. Right. The Bible says you're not to be, in, be entangled with the affairs of life for him who have chosen him to be a soldier. You've got to live for Jesus Christ in your life and be a light to this dark world. And the world's going to go the direction it's going to go. There's nothing we can do about it. God said it's going to happen. Right. But be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I, found not thy, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. People start get, losing sight of this and start getting distracted by that out there, the world. They start getting distracted and their works start failing. They stop living for the Lord. They start doing things that they used. They gave up for the Lord. They start bringing things back in their life that they gave up for the Lord. They start doing things the world's way. Mocking is a good one. I've seen that a lot online. The mocking, the name calling, the backbiting, the whispering, the railing for railing. We're commanded not to do that. And at one time, a lot of those brothers that I see doing it wouldn't do it because the Bible said we're not to do it. What happened? They're doing it now. They've taken their eyes off Jesus Christ. They're probably following someone who took their eyes off Jesus Christ. But what did we just read in 2 Timothy 4.3? We read this. Strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But this is Christ. We've got to fight harder than ever to make sure that our, this is the center of our life and we're living it. That we're standing for the doctrines of this book. And we're not falling away. I don't want to be part of the falling away, brother says Christ. I said this before, when Jesus comes back, is he going to look at me and say, well done, when he calls me up, is he going to look at me and go, well done, thou good and faithful one? Or is he just going to, when he calls me up there at the judgment seat of Christ, just look at me and shake his head, and, here's your penny, move on, next. What's it going to be? Yeah, what's it going to be for you, brother says to Christ? Are you going to be standing firm? 2 Timothy 4, 5, after it gets them talking about they will not endure sound doctrine, 
But after their own lusts have teachers have an itching ears, and they shall turn their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. He says, 2 Timothy 4, 5 says, Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. I'm sorry. Second, I did it wrong. Please forgive me. Lost my, lost my mark in here. 2 Timothy 4, 5 says, But watch thou in all things. 4, 3, we just read there through 4, shall be turned from the ears. It talks about how people are turning from the doctrines. 2 Timothy 4, 5 says, But watch thou in all things. Watch thou in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. They are failing the Lord. Doesn't mean you have to fail the Lord. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departures at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now there was times where I'd say, could you say that? Well, I've heard men out of pride and ego say that. But in meekness, humbleness, charity, having charity for the brethren, someone that that, that mindset, could you say this? That you've kept the, good, the, kept the faith. You've fought the good fight. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. Now stop for a second. He's talking about keeping the faith, the life he's living, keeping the faith, fighting the good fight. He was in full-time ministry. He's fighting the good fight, but he's keeping the faith. He's taking God's word and his teachings, the doctrines that God had taught him. He's teaching it to others, and he's living them. Now that's what it says here. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, living right, righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me of that day, and not me only, but unto all them that also love his appearing. Then it goes back to looking for that blessed hope. What does it mean to look for that blessed hope? To live a life of Christ. If you're truly looking, you're going to make sure that your life lines up with this book and that you're doing everything you can to please God okay? and do things His way because He's the one you serve now. He's the one that you live for now. Titus 1.1. 1, 1. Turn to Titus chapter 1, which is right there. Titus 1.1. 1, 1. Let's read what Paul says to Titus. So Paul tells Timothy that doctrine is very important. And if you, you, there's people that are going to come in that are going to mess up doctrine. And when you mess up doctrine, you're going to mess up your life. Timothy, don't mess up doctrine. Don't be like them. Okay? And, uh, you know, it says right there, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Continue to do the work. Don't let them change you. And don't change with them. Don't be part of the falling away. Titus 1.1. 1, 1. Now he's talking to Titus, a man in ministry. Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and to the acknowledgement of the truth, which is after godliness. The truth is after godliness. If you have the truth, you're going to live the truth. Verse 2, in hope of eternal life. There we get that blessed hope again. Paul's looking for it. I, I know some people that teach that Paul wasn't looking for the blessed hope. Yes, he was. Right there, in hope of eternal life. We're gonna, this mortality must put on immortality. And we're going to live forever with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Which God, that cannot lie, promised us from the world began. Before the world began. But it hath in due times manifested his word through preaching. Which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, my own son, after the common faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Ordained elders. You have elders that are in the body of Christ. That's just people that are elderly. And then you have ordained elders. That's the difference. But that's another teaching. But he's, as we get through here, he's ordaining elders. He's ordaining bishops. Why? So they can keep the doctrines and keep preaching them and teaching them after he's gone. What Titus would do and what Timothy would do is when they lead a group of people and there's a church, which is the body of Christ in an area, Paul would leave one of these guys behind to set up the church. 
to get the church organized. Okay, you need elders, you ordained elders, you need bishops, and you guys, here's what you guys need to be teaching. The doctrines, this is what you guys need to be standing for. They would set them up, and once they got done, Paul would be like, okay, you done? I need you over here to get back to the ministry of reconciliation, okay? Preaching the word, uh, preaching the gospel, I mean, to new people that need to hear the gospel, okay? That as I have appointed there, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife. Now, please, I'm just going to throw this in there. Watch out for brethren who will twist that and use that to attack other men in ministry. It doesn't say one marriage. They're only married once. It doesn't say that. Stop adding to Scripture. What does it say? Let's read it again. If any man be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly. Titus wasn't married. Timothy wasn't married. But they took on the office of a bishop. This is saying that if you're a husband, because it calls him the husband, if that's your state, the husband, then you have one wife. Present tense. Present tense. Does that man have one wife? Yes. Then he qualifies. Period. Okay. I don't want to go off too much on a rabbit tail, but I told him, I said, there's men that aren't married that can be bishops. There are men that are married that don't have children that can be bishops. There are men that have been married once, twice, three times that still qualify to be a bishop. Let's say you get married to a wife at a young age, and she dies at a young age. The man remarries to another wife. Oh, he's been married twice, so he doesn't qualify, right? No, it says that if he's a husband, which he, the second time he got married, if he's a husband, is he the husband of one wife? Yes, he still can qualify. But remember, this is just one qualification of many. He has to be blameless, too. Okay. Don't let people deceive you. When it says the husband of one wife, it's saying the husband, present tense. If he's a husband, present tense, he has one wife. Okay. The Bible talks about how a wife can commit adultery and you can get a, a writ of divorce. And now you're set, You're gone. You're not husband and wife anymore. According to the scriptures. The whole point of this is you're not allowed to have multiple wives. You're the husband of one at any given time, present tense, you have to be the husband of one wife. Don't want to get into that too much. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. Not self-will, not soon to anger, angry, not soon angry. Not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men. Sober, just, holy, temperate. There's a lot to be teaching in here, but we're going to get to the point for our teaching. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. you got the elders. The ordained elders. Okay, You've got them being taught doctrine and truth. You've got bishops that are being taught doctrine and truth. How do we know that? Because we keep reading here. It says that he may be able to buy sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. So like I said, you've got Timothy, and you've got Titus. Sometimes it mentions Silas, too, and sometimes Paul mentions some other men. But these are two books that, got, that Paul wrote letters to these two men saying, Hey, you're supposed to be teaching sound doctrine. And you're supposed to be passing it on down to the people. Okay? You're supposed to be passing that doctrine hardcore down from men so that when the elder men die, the next man that comes up, he continues in the sound doctrine. Okay? You pass it on. But it's also supposed to be taught to the body of Christ as a whole. Okay? Faithful word as he hath been taught, and sound, that may be by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. No matter what they say, no matter what the world does, okay, subvert whole houses, teaching things what they ought not for filthy lucre's sake, you're supposed to stick to the doctrines of this book. The gospel, the true plan of salvation is a doctrine. Eternal security is a doctrine. Okay? Um, pre time of Jacob's trouble, cash away the body of Christ, which includes looking present tense every day for that blessed hope with the life that you're living. Believing in the imminent return of Jesus Christ with the life that you're living. 
These are doctrines that you apply to your life and how you live your life. That this book, that God's word is important and God's word is true, that is a doctrine. Mm -hmm. That's a doctrine that goes through the whole Bible. It's been true through the whole Bible. His words that he gave Moses were true. The words that he gave Adam and Eve were true. Did they not get kicked out of the garden if they, if they did what they did? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But for filthy lucre's sake, okay, one thing that will derail sound doctrine, brothers and Christ, we're almost coming, getting close to the end. One of the things that derails sound doctrine in a ministry is when the ministry becomes money-oriented. It'll, de it'll destroy the ministry when it becomes money-oriented, and their doctrines will start getting shaky to the, and bending until the point where they break it. Okay, I don't believe in the, I'm looking for that blessing. I don't believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Oh, I once believed the King James Bible was God's word, but now, oh, I was, I did get saved off repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you, but now I'm, I kind of believe in easy beliefs of this, easy believism. Oh, I believed you were eternally secure, but now I believe that there's certain things that you can do to lose your salvation. You see what's going on? It doesn't just, with someone who once stands for the truth, it just doesn't snap overnight. It's over time they start flexing and trying to compromise the doctrines. And the next thing you know, they compromise it to the point where it snap, it breaks. And now, they're not following the doctrines here. They're following false doctrine. And money is a big way that pushes it. When you become money-oriented, because you want to please the crowd, so the money comes in. You see this in the Babel buildings. You see this in TV online ministries. You'll see it online here, on YouTube. Okay. 1 Timothy 5.18. How many people heard this one? 1 Timothy 5.18 says, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his reward. I have. But here's the thing. How many of you used... If someone's attacked me, I don't take money. And not because of pride. God's already provided for me and we're in hard times. God's already provided for me. If the time comes where I need it and I'm really doing this, I might put out a donation. But right now God's provided for me. I've had brethren ask me. I agree. I'm thankful for it. But there's other brethren out there in ministry. There's other brethren out there that aren't in ministries that are hurting that could use your help. Okay? But if I was ever to take money and someone yells at me, how dare you take money? You're taking money from people. Then I read that verse to him. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. However, what I'm seeing is a lot of people are starting to take that verse and use it to push people and bully people into donating. Be careful. That's not used to bully people into donation. How do we know that? 2 Corinthians 9, 7 we read, Every man according as he is purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly being bullied or guilt-tripped, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a chill for giver, a cheerful giver. How many of you heard this before? You should, you should be donating to some kind of ministry. I have. I've heard that's been said. That's not what the Bible says. We're supposed to not give out of necessity, but you always seems to sit ministries that that the that the ministry itself has become an income. Whether it was about money to begin with, like with these uh, faith healers, it's all about money to begin with and pleasing the crowd. But even if you start out right, because the Bible talks a lot about turning from the truth. In other words, they once stood for the truth and they turned from it. What happened? The ministry was no longer a life calling; it became an income. It became a 9 to 5 job, and it's an income, and I need this income to keep up my life here, that I want. Okay, they have this life that they put together for themselves, and they choose, they treat the ministry as if it's an income. And then when the income starts dropping, what happens? A lot of them start compromising. Not all, but a lot of them start compromising. Okay? The ministry is not an income, so you can live your dream life. I have this in my notes. You cannot, it's not about that. Just a little rabbit trail. Bre brethren that want to be in ministry. If you're in ministry like I am, I'm not full-time ministry. You can still have some of the things that other brothers have. But if you're going to get into full-time ministry like Paul was, like Timothy was, we're reading the book of Timothy, we're reading the book of Titus. If you're going to get into full-time ministry where you're going to be a um, bishop, 
of an actual house church, a physical house church there, you're going to have to make a lot of sacrifices. You can't live the same life as those that go to the house church. Okay, you're going to have to make a sacrifice. But there's some people out there that want to say, I'm full-time ministry, and yet they want the same things as the rest. They're not willing to make any sacrifices. They still want to live their dream life. What happens when you become money-oriented? You start perverting the doctrines that are in this book to please the crowd so you can keep that money coming in. I'll say it again. The Babel buildings are a big example of this. TV evangelists, they with good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Timothy, don't have to turn here, but Timothy chapter 6 verse 8, it says, And having food and raiment, let us there be with content. Who's the us there? Men in ministry. You've got to be content with food and raiment. Someone else can be like, well, I want a wife, I want children, I want, remember the, the American dream, the white house with the white picket fence? Okay? Uh, some people like me, I like living by the ocean. There's some people that like, the, they like living in the cities. I don't know why, especially nowadays, <laughs> but they like living in the cities. There's some people who like living in the countryside, just outside the city. There's some people who like to live out in the boonies. Okay. But when you give your life to Christ, you got to go where God wants you. You've got to sacrifice any dream life that you, I've always dreamed of living like this, and I've always dreamed of living like that. You've got to give that up for the Lord. Sacrifice. And you've got to be content with food and raiment. Philippians 4.11 we read, Not that I speak in respect of want. This is Paul. For I have learned, that's a key there, I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, or whatever state I am, therewith be content. Men that want to be in ministry, full-time ministry, you can't be money-driven. Okay? You must learn to be content. It says learn. Paul had to learn it. Okay, this is what God has for me. i got to learn to live this way. I see the brethren around me. I mean, they got families. They've got wives. They've, they're living their dream life. Not dream life, but they're living a life that's different than me. They go to a secular job. They work the land and sell the goods from their land and everything to keep going every day. But that's not me. I would love to have that life, but Lord, I gave up that for you to be full-time ministry. And I've learned to be content. That's a hard thing, even for me. I'm, I'm trying, there's times where I have to learn to be content with what God has for me. Making some Bible studies here and there, staying in the Word of God, and doing work around the house and the property here. Right? I'm not full-time ministry. And I'm not a bishop. But if you're going to be a full-time minister and you're going to be a bishop, if you don't want to become like a lot of these Bible building preachers and fall away and turn from the doctrines of this book, you can't be money-oriented. I've seen it happen online. I've seen it happen in the Bible buildings. You see it on the TV evangelists. People being sued. This falling apart. That's falling because of money. Money, 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 money. They're money-oriented. Titus was warned, not filthy. That, see what they're doing for filthy lucre's sake? They're compromising the word of God for money. They compromise the word of God so they can live how they want to live. Don't become like them. Right? Stay with Titus chapter one, verse twelve. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, "The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies." This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. What's the point of rebuking someone sharply? Aha, so I can win and destroy that man over there? No. So they can be sound in the faith. I've said this before. Uh, yes, we are to rebuke sharply. Okay? We're to rebuke sharply. What does the Bible say about this book? It's a double-edged sword. Cuts both ways. Dividing the asunder. And knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is what we're supposed to use to, to rebuke sharply. Hey, that doctrine, you're starting to turn away from that doctrine. Hey, that wicked sin that you're doing, this is what we use to rebuke sharply. And the thing about it that I want to go off just a little bit, when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to instruction and righteousness, it says rebuke sharply. Now, if you look at the word sharply, it says with a keen edge or a fine point does not say pride, bitterness, or vengeance. And the reason I mean that is, is that 
you got to stick to the point. When you rebuke, the Bible says you're in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. In meekness. But the sharply part there it doesn't say destroying them. That's what I mean by the pride, and bitterness, and the vengeance. I do it in a way that I can destroy that man. No, that's not what the Bible says. Okay, the sharply there, it says with a keen edge or a fine point. In other words, it means stick to the point. All right. We already read 2 Timothy 2.25, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God preventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. You're to, you're to rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. 1 Corinthians 5.8 we read, Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What it means to rebuke someone sharply is you don't beat around the bush. One of the tactics, you stick to the point, one of the tactics on here, a lot of the arguing and fighting and, and the, the division and everything, people forgot what the argument started at. It started with the disagreement of, over something like this, and then over time this got put to the side, and now they're fighting and arguing over this. They're fighting and arguing over this. My banner's not down. They're fighting and arguing over this. They, they could be fighting and arguing over this. I hold up a gospel track. They start fighting on that. They start fighting on this and this. What's the whole thing? The whole point of what I'm trying to say by this is Christ is that's a tactic of Satan. When you have a disagreement with the scriptures, you stick to the point And you hold firm and stand firm for the word of God. You don't attack someone personally. You don't start holding their past sins against them and trying to distract people from the truth. Because how do you distract from the truth? You take this away and make it about this. Oh, that man, he's fat and overweight, therefore what he's teaching is, is wrong. That's not supposed to be our foundation. If I'm fat and overweight, it's not my weight that's in judgment. It's what am I teaching? Is it right or is it wrong? But they'll try to distract you from that and getting you arguing and making fun of like weight, beard, the hat, the banners, whatever, past sins, past mistakes, and then sometimes they'll make up, like uh, fault, bearing false witness. They'll make stuff up. Why? Because they're going to try to tear this, get you distracted by tearing this right here down and getting you to attack this too. And then now you've forgotten what was our disagreement to begin with? What started everything? I've had brethren on there going, oh, you broke fellowship with so-and-so? I said, do you know why our fellowship fell apart? He actually goes, you know what? I've heard so much junk going back and forth, I don't remember. That's right. Satan won. This is where we're supposed to stand, brothers says Christ. If we have a problem with one another when it comes to the scriptures, we need to stick to the scriptures. Rebuke sharply. Stick to the point and hold to it. Okay. I'm doing my best. I'm still trying to do my set, but that's, I've been tempted to get into all that garbage that's going on online. I've really been tempted, but I'm going to stick to the point. Okay. The major doctrines. Okay. I'm going to stick to them. The instruction in righteousness. This word is God's perfect written word. I'm going to stick to this and rebuke those men that have been attacking me lately. I rebuked them sharply with this. Standing for truth. Mm -hmm. It says there, this witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Sound doctrine. Remember, sound doctrine, sound faith. Perfect. Without error. So their faith can be perfect. And not fake, not false. That they don't lose faith in what's right and start putting their faith in things that are wrong. Right? Go back to Titus chapter 1 verse 14. Remember, when you rebuke sharply, you're sticking to the point. You don't beat around the bush, and you do it out of sincerity and truth, and it's to build them back up, so they can be sound in the faith. Titus 1.14, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men. Like I said, a lot of times you find men out there that their doctrine's all screwed up and messed up. They're going off traditions of men and the commandments of men. 
well, this person taught it to this person and this person, and it just becomes traditions of men, and the traditions of men trump the Word of God. No, they do not. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men and turning from the truth. Right? First, turn from the truth, meaning that they once stood for the truth. Once again, I'll say this again. Second, you want to turn there? Second Thessalonians 2 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And the number one way people fall away in, in sin for a season is sin for a season. The commandments of men, the Jewish fables, they turn from the truth. Why do they turn from the truth? For sin for a season. The number two reason is respecter of persons, the commandments of men. That's the two reasons. I'm a follower of this person, so I'll turn from the truth because he's turning from the truth, but I've got to follow him. The other one is they turn from the truth because of sin for a season. You don't hear from people from sometimes for a while, brothers and sisters of Christ for a while. Why? Because they might be falling back into sin and wickedness, and they don't, they're trying to hide it. But they start turning from the truth. Acts 10.34, don't turn, you don't have to turn there, we're going to stay in uh, Titus 1.14, but Acts 10.34 says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of the truth I perceive that God is not a respecter of persons. We ought to obey God rather than men. Right? You've made the command. Jesus got onto the Pharisees. You've made the commandments of God of none effect by your traditions. The commandments of men. God's not a respecter of persons. This is the final authority. And if that man once stood for this pray, and he stands for it, praise the Lord. But if the man that you're watching starts turning from this, you're to follow this. Not that man. Okay? God's not a respecter of persons. Why are you? You're supposed to have a love of the truth. 1 Corinthians 1.12 Now this I say that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Paulus, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And that's time I have to tell people. I always replace that with so-and-so's name. Were you baptized by so-and-so? Were you baptized into his name? Who saved you? Jesus Christ. You need to be obeying this and following this. If he's going left, you don't follow him. You stay to the course and you stay with this. And it's hard these last days. If it means that you have to put him out of the fellowship, you have to stop supporting him, then that's what you do. You stay focused on this and God will deal with him and try to get him back on the right path. You can try to rebuke him sharply, but like I said, meek with meekness, uh, instructing those that oppose themselves. Try to get him back on the right path. But if he won't listen to you, then you got to let him go. Right? You're not to follow him if they're leading you down the wrong path. But we see they're not given to Jewish fables and commandments of men that respect our persons. It seems to have a good hold on people. In the battle building system, online, right? and they turn from the truth. 1 Corinthians 3.3 3, we read, For ye are yet carnal. For whereas, you, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For why one saith, I am of Paul, and another saith, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Good man of God or poor man of God? If the doctrine is wrong, it is wrong. It is wrong. If the doctrine is right, it is right. The doctrine is what matters, and this book is what matters. We get to learn from other people, absolutely learn from teachers. But when a teacher starts going left or starts going right, and the doctrines start changing... What happened? They stopped looking for Jesus Christ. More than likely, they stopped looking for that blessed hope. That's what I've seen. And, and, and people that I believe are saved, that were Bible believers, that are Bible believers, uh, the reason they get started getting really messed up with the world and you know the commandments of men and traditions of men, uh, sin for a season, is because they take their eyes off Jesus Christ. They stop looking for that blessed hope. And then they try to get this to start to conforming how they're living. And they start perverting this to justify what they're doing. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. 
if the doctrine's wrong, it's wrong. Right? We're not supposed to not give heed to Jewish fables, not giving heed to commandments of men that turn from the truth. Acts 5.27, remember keep your hand in Titus 1, Acts 5.27, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest and asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye not, should not teach in this name? The commandments of men. This is Paul. I think John. Paul and John. Or Peter. I'm sorry. Peter and John. And behold, ye have fulfilled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. When people start turning from the doctrines that this Bible teaches, you need to follow the doctrines that this Bible teaches, not those men. You need to obey God over that man. You need to be pleasing God more than pleasing that man. Titus 1.15, Unto the pure all things are pure. Back to Titus 1.15. Unto the pure, all things are pure. If this is what your foundation is, and you're doing your best to follow it, unto the pure, all things are pure. Like I said, like I said we'll find out where this book is right, and we'll find out where I'm wrong. If I'm right, it's because this book is right. If I'm wrong, it's because I'm not following this book. This book is always right. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but to them that are defiled, using Bible perversions, turning their back on truth, commandments of men that turn from the truth, sin for a season, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, the lost world, but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God. But in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. They'll have good works. I've tried to tell this to people. Don't be deceived. Just because they have good works that line up with the scriptures doesn't mean that they're saved. Okay? We have good works because we are saved. We do good works because we're saved. I need to say it right. We're living for Jesus Christ. We're doing what's right. But this says that they every good work reprobate. Only time good works are reprobate is this, if you're not saved. When you get saved, one of the things you, I was never taught, but until after I got saved, truly saved, but I was never taught as a false convert, there's the judgment seat of Christ. Why is it so important to hold the doctrines, to hold the instruction righteous, to live a life of Christ? Because someday, even as a saved sinner, I'm going to have to stand before Jesus Christ and be judged and I'm going to have to answer for my life as a Christian. And the works that I do down here are being tallied up there at the judgment seat of Christ. Why are these works, every good work, reprobate? Because they can do all the good works they want. If they don't have Jesus Christ, they're going to go to hell and they're going to burn in the lake of fire for all eternity. The good works mean nothing. And I'm really emphasizing that I was never taught that. It's a change, like I said, that, doc, that doctrine of the judgment seat of Christ, that's another doctrine. It's life-changing. It's altering. I need to get busy for the Lord. I need to get busy living for Him. I need to get busy reading my Bible and knowing this book. I need to get busy studying this book. I need to get busy doing something for the Lord. Gospel tracting. Preaching the gospel to everyone around me. I need to be living for the Lord and doing things for Him. Because someday I'm going to have to stand before him and answer for my life here as a Christian. I say as a Christian, but as a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, part of the church of the living God, a saved sinner, someone who is in Christ Jesus our Lord, I'm going to have to answer for my life down here. One of the false teachings of the easy believism and these battle buildings is once you get saved, you, you're free. You can do whatever you want. Uh, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. Oh, you won't be judged. You, you've escaped. You've escaped judgment. You don't have to get judged anymore. Well, I'm not going to get judged at the great white throne. Absolutely not. But I'm still going to get judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Yes, I'm not going to hell. I could sin a lot as a, as a Bible-believing. That's kind of, <laughs> kind of a 
goes against each other. If you're sinning a lot, then are you really Bible-believing and God-fearing? You can still have sins as a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman out there, okay? Those sins aren't going to send you to hell. Yes, you, you, you're not going to go to hell when you die. But you're still going to have to answer for your life as a Christian, okay? So the only time good works is reprobate versus Christ is when you're lost. And can lost people have good works that line up with the Scripture? Can a lost man give up alcohol? Absolutely. But you oftentimes will replace it with a, another addiction. Right? But the point is, is it doesn't matter if he gave up alcohol. Does he have Jesus Christ? Now that he has Jesus Christ, he gives up alcohol for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because God's word says that drunkenness is wrong. If he's a drunkard. Okay? And so on and so forth. Like I said, doc, doctrines are life-changing. They change how you live your life and who you're living your life for. Why did I get rid of this? Why did I get rid of that? I did it for my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because He commanded me to. The lost world can go, well, I gave it up because I was told it was bad. I did it for good morals. It's not the same. Okay? In the sense of, you're still on your way to hell. You need Jesus Christ. Okay? So doctrines can be false and they can be true. And there's many things that come in and pervert the truth. Paul had to warn Titus. He had to warn Timothy to make sure that your doctrine doesn't get perverted like I've seen along here. I've seen these men perverting the doctrines. Okay? We didn't get into this, but um, there was two men that... This, uh, I, we've quoted this in the verses before, but I don't have this in my notes. But they decided that the res they turned their back on the resurrection and decided the resurrection had already come. And they overthrew the faith of some. Okay? Paul was seeing people turning, in his day, turning from the truth from the doctrines that were being preached. People coming in and messing everything up. Okay? What is doctrine? A life teaching. It's a teaching that changes how you live your life. It'll change how you see the world. And it also shows you change who you're living for. That's what the doctrine is. Okay? And that, like I said, how many of us, for the gospel, have a testimony that it was life-changing, it changed how I see myself in the world. And it changed who I'm living for. Oh yeah, it did. That's what doctrine does. Right? So that's the first part here we're getting into doctrine. When it comes to looking for that blessed hope, are you staying in this book? Are you taking the doctrines that this book teaches for today? Are you studying this book? Are you reading this book? That's a sign that you're looking, for the, you're looking for that blessed hope. That's one of the signs of many that we're going to be talking about. But one of them is the doctrines. The gospel. Eternal security. Uh, the judgment seat of Christ. The Godhead. The pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ, okay? Uh, the fact that God's word is pure as silver tried in the fire seven times. Okay, going through talking about how important God's word is, that he places his word above his own name. These are doctrines. Are you taking these doctrines, hiding them in your heart, and living them? The Bible says you're to obey the gospel. This is addressed to saved sinners saying you need to obey the gospel. It's a life that you're living. And I've told you this, brother, this is Christ, and I'll say it again. You can be a verbal testimony, or you, and you can be a living testimony. You're supposed to be both. The way you live your life for Jesus Christ is supposed to shine to the lost world. And they say, I want what he has. I don't know what he's got, but I want what he has. You're supposed to be a living testimony. When it says obey the gospel, it's an action. You're supposed to live a life of Christ that Jesus bought you. God purchased you with his blood by this, His Son, and you belong to Jesus Christ now, and He tells you what to do and what not to do. And you, as you live your life for Jesus Christ, you're a light to the world. Okay? There's a part one in this study, I know it's long, but we're going to get into part two, where we're going to actually go into the doctrines, and we're going to show how they're perverted. Okay? And why? Because brethren aren't looking for, the, for that blessed hope, and it gets perverted because people don't want to change. They don't want their life to change. They don't want their view of this world and their wicked flesh. They don't want that to change. And they don't want to change who they're living for. 
They're living for themselves. They're carnally minded and walking after the flesh, and they don't want to change that. And that's what happens when you see a lot of the doctrines get perverted. That's why. Sin for a season. All right. So we're going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, from grace and peace from God our Father. Remember, that's how Paul talked to Timothy. That's how Paul talked to Titus. My goal for you, brothers and Christ, is to exhort you with this, to make sure that this is your final authority, that you're keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ through His Scriptures, living them every day. We're in the last days. I do want grace and peace among the body of Christ. I don't like all the division. I don't like the falling away. But God said it's going to happen. Titus was warned. Timothy was warned. Okay? They, they, they turned from the truth. In other words, they had it, but then they turned from it. Right? The falling away. I want grace and peace. So that's why I always say this. Grace and peace from God our Father and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. Please, please make sure this is your foundation. And I will see you in the next video, part two of this series. And we're going to go over the doctrines.